welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on this channel we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and starting with this episode I'm going to begin a mini-series about the most influential Cosa Nostra crime families and I'm going to start today with the Genovese family, the third largest organized crime family in the United States. So why am I starting with the third largest? Well first and foremost the Genovese family is the oldest of the five New York families, but this family also has the most colorful cast of characters who have taken the role of boss, and I wanted to discuss all of them with you today. In order to thoroughly and accurately give you all the information about the Genovese family and leadership, it's going to have to be a two-part episode, so let's get started on part one. What we now refer to as the Genovese crime family actually started as the Morello gang back in 1892, by Giuseppe Morello. Giuseppe Morello was born on May 2nd, 1867 to Calogero and Angela Piazza Morello in Corleone, Sicily. Giuseppe was born with a disfigured right hand with one finger resembling a claw. Giuseppe's father died in 1872. His mother then married Bernardo Terranova, a Corleone Mafia member. Bernardo and Angela Terranova would have many children together, including Niccolo and Vincenzo. More on them a little later. Morello was involved in crime early and by 1889 was a lieutenant in the Streva crime family in Corleone led by Paulino Streva. Morello left for the United States when police official Giovanni Vela, who was preparing to prosecute Paulino Streva, was shot and killed in the streets. Anna de Puma, a witness to this murder, claimed to have seen Giuseppe Morello at the scene of the crime. It's important to note that Anna de Puma was later found shot dead after making this accusation. Now fearing prosecution, Morello left for the United States and arrived in New York City in September of 1892. Six months later, his wife, sister, half-brothers, and half-sisters would arrive in New York City as well. Giuseppe and his family dabbled in several businesses, first moving to Louisiana to work on a sugarcane plantation, then moving to Texas to work picking cotton. It was in Texas where the family became ill with malaria and where his wife died. The family moved back to New York City and Morello did not stop dabbling. He worked in saloons, he worked in restaurants, date factories, the construction business, but continued to work in the criminal realm as well, where he found his stride in counterfeit. Morello was arrested and charged for passing counterfeit bills in 1900, but he was discharged. Before the Mafia Commission, there were other attempts to unify the Cosa Nostra families in the United States and Sicily. In 1901, Morello was actually appointed the boss of bosses by Sicilian leaders. The Morello gang was on its way to success. It was not until 1909 that Morello could be successfully charged with counterfeiting and received a 20-year prison sentence. He lost the official title of boss for the Morello gang, but would return to power after his sentence was served. Giuseppe Morello was the head of the now Genovese family from his arrival in the United States in 1892 to his arrest and one year behind bars in 1909. Giuseppe's half-brother Niccolo, Nicholas Terranova, would take over as boss in 1910. Nicholas Terranova, or Nick Morello as he came to be known, was boss during a very tumultuous time. Issues arose with the Brooklyn or Neapolitan branch of the Camorra crime organization closing in on the Cosa Nostra or Morello territory in East Harlem in Greenwich Village after a Morello ally in that territory had been murdered. As you recall from a previous video, the Camorra is one of the four major crime syndicates that originate in Italy. The Morello gang reacted to the murder of their ally by murdering one of the Camorra members. The Morello gang then offered a peace deal, which Pellegrino Morano, the leader of the Brooklyn Camorra, refused. Morano had Nicholas Terranova murdered on September 7, 1916. Morano and his top members were promptly arrested and sentenced to life in prison for the murder in 1917. With the absence of leadership, the Neapolitan Camorra was assimilated into the American Cosa Nostra by 1919. This decision sowed the seed for major ideological differences that ultimately culminated in the Castellamorese War in 1931. We'll get to that a little bit later in this video. Following Nicholas Terranova's death, his brother Vincenzo Terranova would take over as head of the Morello gang. So fun fact, Vincenzo had actually been charged with 
Giuseppe Morello with counterfeiting, but he was discharged and Giuseppe was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Vincenzo Terranova was boss over a fairly peaceful time and he gave control back to his half-brother Giuseppe Morello in 1920 after he was released from prison. Giuseppe Morello and Vincenzo Terranova both had hits taken out on them within the first year of Giuseppe's release. By 1922, Giuseppe Morello had a lot to contend with. The man who taken out the hit on him and Vincenzo was named Salvatore di Aquila. He was Morello's former captain. Morello, as a response to this, all of this, left for Sicily to gain support of the mafiosi there. On May 8th, 1922, Vincenzo Terranova was murdered wearing his typical pinstripe suit and diamond rings in a drive-by shooting near his Manhattan home by Umberto the Ghost Valenti. Terranova fought back, firing his pistol at the gunman in the vehicle, but he had been shot several times and died as a result of his injuries. Umberto Valenti was the chief assassin for Salvatore Diacola, the founder of the now Gambino crime family and former captain of Giuseppe Morello. Don't worry, we're going to talk all about Salvatore Diacola in the Gambino crime family video, but for now, let's stay focused on the Genovese family. Umberto Valenti fell out of favor with Salvatore Diacola, in order to get back in Salvatore Diacola's good graces, Valenti sought to murder Giuseppe Morello and his chief protector, Joe Mazzaria. Giuseppe Morello, by August of 1922, had begun transitioning out of the role of boss and into the role of consigliere for Giuseppe Joe Mazzaria when Umberto Valenti attempted to murder Mazzaria. Despite Umberto Valenti's record as a skilled marksman and having killed Vincenzo Terranova, he missed all three shots he took at Miseria outside of his home on August 8th, 1922. Instead of murdering Miseria, Valenti left two bullet holes in Miseria's straw hat. This cemented Joe Miseria as the man who could dodge bullets and the official boss of the then Morello, now Genovese crime family. Now with Morello as Miseria's consigliere, a message was sent out to Valenti just hours after the shooting saying that Miseria wanted to make peace. On August 11, 1922, Umberto Valente was called to a peace conference by Miseria's representatives in the cafe on 12th Street and 2nd Avenue. Upon arriving to the peace meeting, Umberto Valenti knew it was a setup. Legend stands that Giuseppe Morello was actually present at that meeting and it was at that point that Umberto Valente knew it was over. He ran out of the cafe as fast as he could, but it didn't do him any good because he was murdered by one of Miseria's top marksmen, Charles Lucky Luciano. After Umberto Valenti's murder, Salvatore Diacola's power waned, and Joe Miseria was the most powerful mafioso. Now in the prohibition era of organized crime, Miseria, his associates, his rivals, and his allies were raking in millions of dollars with the sale and distribution of illegal alcohol. Filled with ambition, boss over one of the most prosperous times in organized crime's history, and legendary in crime circles as the man who could dodge bullets, Joe Mazzaria sought more and more power. He wanted the coveted title of boss of bosses. This hunger for power came to a head in 1931 with his chief rival and the head of what is the now Bonanno crime family, Salvatore Maranzano, in the Castella Marese War. While the names associated with the Castella Marese War will always be Salvatore Maranzano, and Joe Masseria, the real reason for the war was an ideological battle. It was an ideological battle about how Cosa Nostra was going to be run. The traditionalist or mustache Pete view held that only Sicilians could be made men in Cosa Nostra, while the progressive or young Turk view held that a man only needed to be an Italian. Salvatore Maranzano was the head of the traditionalist view, while Joe Masseria was the head of the progressive view. Everyone knew this war was bad for business. It was attracting media and police attention, and it was chipping away at all of the success that they had built up from the Prohibition era. Joe Mazzaria was not doing well in this war, and Lucky Luciano infamously changed alignments. He made a deal with Salvatore Maranzano to engineer Mazzaria's death in exchange for being second in command with Maranzano's crew. Maranzano agreed, and Joe Mazzaria was killed on April 15th, 1931, proving he was not, in fact, able to dodge bullets. Following Miseria's death, Salvatore Maranzano declared himself capo de tutti capi, or boss of bosses. Maranzano's reign as boss of bosses only lasted about five months, and that's when Lucky Luciano double-crossed his co-conspirator and put a hit out 
on Salvatore Maranzano. Salvatore Maranzano was killed on September 10th, 1931. Lucky Luciano would then claim his role as boss of the Genovese family with Joe Bonanno stepping up to take Salvatore Maranzano's place with his namesake crime family. I will cover the remainder of Lucky Luciano's reign as the boss as well as the Genovese family as a whole in part two. I will also be doing a separate video just about Lucky Luciano. There is just so much to cover with this man that I cannot possibly cover everything in the peripheral. So I will make his own video for him as well as we'll wrap up his reign in part two. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews talking about the history of the oldest mafia family in New York. I will be wrapping this up next episode to discuss how the Genovese family evolved in the 20th century and has moved into the 21st century. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click that notifications button to get more mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.